Hey lovely freaks and welcome back to the podcast. I'm your host Amanda and if you're new here, hi, welcome. If you like things strange and unusual and true crime, you can go ahead and hit that subscribe or follow button. You can also head down to the description box and you'll see a link that will take you to our link tree and there you can find all of our social media like Instagram, Facebook, and all that jazz. As you notice, our intro is a little different today. That's because I'm by myself today. (laughs) Um, Most of you know my sister is she started college. Um, she is living, you know, she's stressed (laughs) to the max and, um, she's living in the dorm rooms. We thought that we would be able to do it this past weekend, but she just had tons of homework and our schedules couldn't line up. So maybe she'll be with us on the next one. Um, but you might be hearing me do these quite often by myself. Um, if I can't find anyone that is to do them with me. Uh, so, you know, if, If you don't like me talking by myself, sorry. (laughs) You can go back and listen to some of the other ones with Hannah. But, yes. So, hopefully she'll be back next week. This case, though, is... um, It's going to be pretty interesting. It's not a very long case. However, this does involve domestic violence. Um, We're also going to have some links in our description of this podcast, there will be links for different hotlines that you can call. Domestic abuse is definitely something that has been amped up in the last year, obviously, because of COVID. Um, 2020 and 2021, you know, was pretty much the worst years for still going on for some people that are still in quarantine has been the worst years for domestic abuse and domestic violence, also child abuse as well. And this kind of has both elements. Um, I'll explain, but we're going to be talking today about the Kelly Ann Bates case. This case is pretty brutal, so when I get to what happens to her, I will put a full trigger warning disclaimer if you'd like to skip that part. Um, It won't be, you know, very detailed, but I will go over some of the things that happen. So let's just begin, shall we? Kellyanne Bates was born May 18th, 1978 in Manchester, England. So this one comes from across the pond um, for us here in the U.S. Her parents were Margaret and Tommy Bates. She was a great daughter and she was athletic. She wanted to be a teacher when she grew up. Everyone that met her said that she was really happy and bubbly. Um, That seems to happen a lot. Every time someone describes someone that gets murdered, you know, it's always that they were just so happy and just a bright, wonderful person. Um, I'm not a happily, happy, bubbly person, so maybe I'll be okay. Uh, (laughs) No, but she was very happy and um, just bubbly and, and she was just, she was a teenager in 19... 92, she was 14, and that's when she met a guy named James. So, it's going to get, it would get a little confusing. I'm going to call him James, uh, but if you read some articles and things like that, you will find that some of them say Dave, because the entire time that she's dating him, her parents, and even she, believed that his name was Dave Smith. But his name was actually James Smith, and they didn't find that out until they got into the trial. Um, But I just didn't want any confusion, so I'm going to call him James because that's his actual name. Once she started dating him, things kind of became a little different. She started becoming a little bit more of a wild child, I guess you could say. Um, She would not come home sometimes, like, in the middle of the night. She would, you know, go out or whatever, and then she wouldn't come home. Her parents thought she was too wrapped up in this new boyfriend of hers, which, by the way, my parents would beat me, like, (laughs) to a pulp if I was 14 and I was not coming home at night. Like, I mean, I'm not saying that her parents did anything wrong here. There's a lot of things that some people do, some people have said in the past and and different comments that I've read and things like that when I read stuff, you know, like her parents were, should have been more harsh and blah, 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 but you don't know what you would do in a situation where your child is 
rebelling, I guess you could say. Um, and this was in the 70s. So this was not like today's age where they could keep a track on her and all this other stuff, you know. They didn't have cell phones back then. So, um, I mean, not in the 70s, the 90s. I'm sorry. She was born in the She was born in 78. This is in the um, early 90s. So, yeah. Um, so they had a, they, she, she hung out with him for a long time and we're talking like two years probably before they ever met him, which I thought was a little odd, but she just told them like, oh, it's just a school friend, you know, um, he goes to school with the same school I do, yada, yada, it's no big deal. Um, she would always go to his place or go out with friends and him and she was just telling him all those different kinds of stuff. So, she, her parents had not met this person, um, and then they finally did after about, it was about a year, year and a half, two, somewhere in there, and they finally met him, and when they did, they were a little shocked because James (laughs) was actually 32 years old. Yeah, that's right. I said that. He was 32. She was 16, and he was 32. Also, come to find out in trial, it actually comes out in trial that he's actually older than that. So he's actually 45, but he tells them that he's 32. Like, you know, 10 difference makes any difference when you're a grown ass man dating a teenager, but whatever. Um, (laughs) so you're probably thinking, okay, well, her parents obviously were like, you're done. Like this is, you're not doing this. Well, her parents were extremely upset um, that this man was dating their little girl. Kelly kept telling them that, like I said, that he was just a schoolmate. So when they found out they were, you know, felt betrayed, they said something was off about him and he just seemed weird whenever they met him as well. I mean, yeah, obviously he's weird. I mean, he's a pedophile. So there's that he's got going against him. But they said also there was just this, just this kind of like evil vibe that they got, I guess you could say. Um, so her parents told her that, it told her she couldn't see him, which only made things worse because I believe like she would sneak out or, you know, she would say that she was going one place, but she was actually going to see him. And their, her parents kind of had this feeling like, okay, if we push her, they just said that they were an interview with her parents, they just said that they were scared that they would lose her. And I can kind of understand that. At the same time, though, I know, like, my parents probably would have, like, some people were like, well, what do you, what do you think about, you know, just locking her in a room or whatever? I mean, yeah, you could do that, but she's still got to go to school. So what are you going to do when she goes to school? Like, are you going to follow her? I mean, you can't really do that. So, My parents would have, though. I mean, (laughs) to be quite honest, my parents probably would have, like, locked me in my room or just been like, okay, well, you're homeschooled now. Um, But, no, I definitely understand where her parents are coming from. The fact that they tried their best and they kept telling her, please, you have to leave. You you can't be with him. You know, blah, 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 blah. I'm not sure, because I know someone's going to ask this. Why didn't they call the police? Because technically this is a pedophile and... You know, they could call the police and make out a report. Um, I don't really know how that works in England. I know here in America, you could definitely do that. You could, you know, say that this man is, uh, I don't I mean, I don't know how you would actually do that. But I'm pretty sure you can call the police and say something to the effect that this man is dating my daughter. He's 30 something and she's 16, you know, and, uh they would probably do something. I don't know. Um, (laughs) I sound really smart right now. I know. But also she, I mean, here in the U S they could have put a restraining order against him, but that's really not going to do much. Restraining orders are a joke. It's just a piece of paper you can throw at somebody. Um, but yeah, I don't know. So I'm, like I said, I'm not sure what the situation is in England, especially at this time, this was still in the nineties. So I digress. They felt like they were in between a rock and a hard place, basically. So, they would break... uh, Kelly and James would break up on and off, but 
you know, the normal teenage stuff. I mean, he's not a teenager, but she is. I'm sure, you know, she'd get mad at him and break up with him and then get back with him or yada yada. But he became pretty possessive. He would make sure that she got on the bus to get home. Okay. But then he would call her mom and he'd be like, hey, Kelly should be coming through the door right now. Like, he would time it down to the minute. And he knew the exact time that that bus got home. And if she wasn't there the exact time, like, let's say he put her on the bus and he knew it took 30 minutes to get home, 30 minutes to the dot, he would call the mom and he'd be like, she should be walking through the door now. And if she didn't walk through the door, he would get irate, upset, freak out, thinking she was out with somebody else, yada, yada, yada. So, eventually, she started showing up at the house with bruises. Kelly did. She obviously would make up excuses for them, like everyone does in domestic violence situations. Um, One time, she said that when she showed up with covered with bruises on one side of her face... um, Her mom, like, freaked out, and she said that a bunch of girls had jumped her on her way home, like, just in the street. A bunch of random girls just jumped her. She never really gave, like, an explanation as to why or what happened, but that's what she said. Her mom obviously knew this was a lie. She also had a bite mark on her hand one time that was, like, really deep and just crazy, which biting someone is so weird to me. Um... There's been a lot of serial killers that have done that, but it's just weird. Along with other things that serial killers do, but (laughs) you know what I mean. Um, Her mother also noted that she started losing a lot of weight as well, and she wasn't really taking care of herself. Um, Like, she wouldn't bathe as much, and she would kind of wear, like, baggy clothes, I guess, to either hide the bruises or to hide the fact that she was losing weight, because... She seemed to be depressed and sad, and her parents were like, this is not the child that we remember two years ago. They would beg her to just leave him because he was, like, totally controlling and under her control. She was 16 at this time, and obviously, like I said, she was groomed because she had been dating this man since she was 14, and unbeknownst to her parents that he was a man, a grown man, she was already groomed by the time he met them or, you know, anything like that. So, it's just really sad. Um, so, one of the things that I want to touch on for just a second is some people might be like, well, why didn't she just leave him? First of all, that goes back to her being groomed. Um, I can tell you that when a child is groomed to do something that a adult or an older person wants them to do, um, they don't really think anything of it. Like, it's not a bad situation, especially when it comes to domestic violence. Um, I've never personally experienced domestic violence. I've had a partner that was mentally abusive, um, but not physically. However, there are people in my family that were... Uh, physically abused as far as, you know, being married to someone that was an abuser in domestic violence situations. And I can tell you that it took them a long time to get out of that situation and it became the only way that they got out of it was because of their children. Kelly didn't have a child. She was a child herself. She was groomed for two years. When an abuser is grooming someone, and this this can go for a child or an adult. I mean, when, when you're starting to date uh, an abusive person, you're not going to see that abuse. You're not going to see them freak out. You're not going to see them, you know, get mad or anything like that. They're going to charm the pants off of you. They're going to bring you flowers. They're going to take you on dates. They're going to be charming. They're going to be, they're going to be like the million dollar man. You're going to be like, oh my God, this is the one. I have found the one that is perfect in every way. But you're going to start seeing subtle little signs of, you know, maybe them freaking out over something small, like a dinner, maybe not on you, but maybe on like the waitress or something like that. Just small little subtle things until it builds and builds and builds and then they start doing it on you, so on and so forth. Um, 
so yeah, it's definitely something that takes time. And he might not have started, well, obviously he didn't start abusing her until she was about 16. So it took a couple of years for him to finally get to the abusive point, I guess you could say. So on November, so that, that was what I wanted to say, you know, don't think that, oh, she didn't want to leave because, I don't know, she loved him and she had these feelings of girly love or whatever like that because I really don't think that was it. I really think that he broke her down so much that she didn't think she had any way to get out because an abuser will also tell you like you're ugly, no one will, no one will love you if it's a, a a sexual abuser, they'll be like no one will believe you, you know, blah 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 and all this different stuff. So she definitely probably thought that there was no way out for her. On November 30th, 1995, Kelly moved into the home with James, into his house. Her parents didn't see her after this. She would, and I don't really know how that went about. Like, I don't know if she just ran away. Um, I don't think they knew where she, where he lived. But I'm not quite sure as to why they didn't call the police and say, you know, my child ran away. But once again, like I said, I don't know how the rules are in England. In the U.S., if your child is not 18, you can call the police and say that they were a runaway. And then they can, can go pick them up. However, eh, they're just going to do it again. Like, they can just keep doing it over and over again. And I think at some point they probably will spend some time in jail, but it wouldn't be very long. So, yeah, I, I'm not really sure. I couldn't find anything out about whether or not they did call the police or, or tried to get her back or whatever. But she would send them cards, Christmas cards, um, cards on their anniversary, all kinds of stuff. But what was weird about it was that it was written in James's handwriting. It wasn't written in her handwriting. Um, by the way, James was divorced, unemployed, and told... Kelly, like I told you earlier, that his name was actually Dave. Um, his girlfriends all said that he was abusive, and his wife. He would actually punch her in the stomach while she was pregnant, and punch her in the legs, and all these different kinds of things. Um, she did have a kid by him, but he was not, he didn't have, like, she left, and, and he didn't ever see his child. Most of the women that he dated, though, were young. They were, like, in their 20s. Um, their one was 15, 17, etc. So, he liked younger women. So, on... This is where things get crazy. So, I'm just going to go ahead and, and... Well, not trigger warning just yet. But, on April 16th, 1997, James arrived at the police station. He calmly walked inside... And when he walked inside, sorry, that was my computer, um, if you heard that sound, <laughs> he walked inside and he told the police that he had accidentally murdered his girlfriend, Kelly, in the bathtub after they had an argument. Yes, he said that. He said he tried to resuscitate her, but it didn't work. The police went to the house and found Kelly's naked body in the tub. It was instantly clear that she had not been, um, you know, just drowned. It was, it was instantly clear that she had been tortured. She was almost unrecognizable, and James was immediately arrested. When her body was examined, it revealed 150 separate injuries. They believed that she had been tortured for at least three, four to th three to four weeks. Um, the pathologist that had done this autopsy said, and I quote, In my career, I have examined almost 600 victims of homicide, but I have never come across injuries so extensive. So, here's the trigger warning. Um, I'm going to list the injuries, and they're pretty severe. So, just bear with me. You can skip through this part if you want to, but just understand that she was very tortured and abused over a f three to f three to four week span. 
So she she had been starved. She had lost almost 40 pounds, and that doesn't even account for the, the weight that she had already lost before she left. Because remember, I told you she was skinny whenever she, or well, she had lost a lot of weight whenever she, um, before she left and moved in with him. So she had lost more weight, so 40 pounds. She had been dehydrated, uh, pretty severely dehydrated to the point where they're almost positive she had not had water for like days. Her knees had been crushed. She had scald marks on her butt and left leg, which looked that they were made um, that they were made with bowling water. There were hot iron burns on her thighs like with a um with a iron like you'd iron a shirt with or something like that she had a fractured arm multiple stab wounds with uh things that they had finally determined that were either a knife like some of the wounds were with a knife a fork or scissors which i thought was really odd that she didn't die from those wounds. I'm not quite sure if, I guess they weren't um, deep enough, but that's the only thing I can figure. She had also had stab wounds inside of her mouth. Her hands were crushed. Her ears, eyes, mouth, lips, and genitals were, had all been mutilated. Both of her eyes, both of her eyes had been gouged out and the examiner said that um, in the eye sockets that were empty, it looks as though there were stab wounds in the eye sockets. The eyes that the pathologist said were, they looked as though they were ripped out um, by some force. Sorry, I lost my spot for a second. Um, so yes, it looks as though they had been ripped out with some sort of force, like I guess either from someone's hands or I'm not exactly sure how that occurred, which is absolutely like fucking awful. Um I got to get through this. Um she looks as though this torture had the the pathologist said it looks as though the the torture had lasted for 3 weeks to five days before her death. She was also partially scalped and there were marks that she had been tied up. So like they think that she had either been tied up sometimes by her hair to the radiator or sometimes by um, like her wrists and things like that. Also to note, she, um, there was blood found everywhere in his apartment. So like, not just the fact that she was found in the bathtub naked and looked like this. There was also blood just everywhere in his apartment when they started going through it. Her official cause of death was drowning, but it seems as though she had been knocked unconscious by the shower head or something that was in the bathtub. So this poor, sweet teenager died at 17 and went through at least three weeks of torture. Um, which, like, we've talked about the Junko case, and this kind of reminds me of that, but can you, I can't even, like, imagine, like, the, it just, it, it hurts. <laughs> it hurts to think about what she went through for those three weeks. And, you know, her dad had said something. Um, I don't remember if it was in an interview or if it was in the trial, but he had said that he was upset because he didn't want his daughter to think that, you know, where's my mom and dad? Like, no one's here to save me or something like that. You know what I mean? Um, but she couldn't get help out, you know? I mean, it's just, it's just really sad. Now, this asshole, James, claims that uh, he didn't do anything. She asked for it. Yeah, that's right. I said that. He said that she liked to be hurt. 
and um, that's why this happened. Because, you know, BDSM takes it to that level. No, it doesn't. Um, that was sarcasm in my voice. So, <laughs> that's not even remotely close to S&M, BDSM. I mean, that's not not something that you do. Maybe some spanking or choking or something like that. But pretty sure gouging someone's eyes out and stabbing their eye sockets it's not really something that um people enjoy not really something they get a sexual thrill out of so um you're a piece of shit for saying that james so on trial he would deny any wrongdoing and say that she would deliberately make him mad so i guess he went from saying that she enjoyed it to saying that she would piss him off so he would just beat her like that you know, is something that can also be, oh, yeah, you're like, it's fine. That's fine. <laughs> yeah, fuck off. So after one hour of deliberation, only an hour, the jury declared that he um, was guilty and they he got the minimum sentence, which was 20 years. Not really sure why that happened. Kind of feel like he should have gotten more than that um just saying i don't but once again i don't know how things work in england uh here in the u.s he probably would have either got the death penalty or life in prison so sadly though um well he's eligible for parole this year i believe but i don't know if he's gonna get out hopefully not hopefully they won't let him out but um one of the things that's kind of sad about this is that margaret Kelly's mom, she actually died last year, um, December 17th, 2020. No, it was not from COVID. She had been battling cancer. She had had breast cancer before, and I believe she was in remission, but she just had a very weakened immune system from all the drugs and the radiation and things like that, and so it was very easy for her to get very sick with something small, and she actually had a um, I believe it was a respiratory infection from a cold. And so she passed away, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, there were different articles that I read where her parents had talked about Kelly and talked about the fact that um, they couldn't really get over it, you know. And obviously, I mean, I, I can't imagine losing a child anyways and losing a child that way like I really don't understand how they kept composure in a courtroom without killing that asshole but that they're better than I am <laughs> um so yeah uh, her parents just said that you know they still thought about her obviously but it was still hard every day to know that she went through that and she probably was wondering like I said earlier was wondering you know where her parents are um so it's just really sad but that is the story of kelly ann bates and the evil piece of trash that is james smith um so like i said he's supposed to be eligible for parole this year don't know if he'll get it probably not hopefully not uh, I don't think he should ever see the light of day again. Uh, and obviously, if he was abusive to his other partners, he found someone that could be isolated from her family and he could take advantage of it. That I believe that's what he was probably searching for. Because all those other girls probably didn't get as far in depth as... um he did well except for the one he married but luckily she got away from him because she probably would have been the one that was next or the one before this one before kelly i mean so it's just really sad um we're gonna put links or i'm gonna put links down for the domestic violence hotlines any kind of thing you can call um even if you know somebody that you know, we've talked about this before on the show when it comes to, like, sex trafficking, kids' violence, um, pedophiles, um, you know, like, uh, kids that you think they're in harm's way, adults that you think that are in harm's way. If you're a neighbor and you hear some shady shit going on next door, um, 
I'm not saying that he had neighbors. I have no idea. But I'm just saying in general, even if you're someone that thinks someone's being domestically abused, call the hotline. Okay? Call the police. I mean, you can anonymously tell the police what you think's going on. And I know we live in a in a society that's like, none of my business. I'm going to stay out of that. But, like, I'm not that person. I'm sorry. I'm not going to be. Like, if I hear my neighbors, which I haven't heard any of my neighbors are old. All of my neighbors that live around me are elderly. Well, except for a few. But if I hear, if I, if I was living in a neighborhood where I knew there was, like, you know, people in their mid-30s, like my age, and, you know, I heard in the middle of the night someone screaming or something like that. Not only would I tell the person to come to my house, like if they're outside or anything, I would tell the woman, you know, get over here now. Um, but I would also call the police because sometimes they don't always have a way to call the police. Sometimes they don't always have a way to, like I said earlier, get out of the situation that they're in. Um, domestic violence is doesn't always end in murder, but it's not a thought that is all, not all, you know, it's a thought that's always in the back of the minds of someone that's being domestically abused because they never know if, okay, this is, this is when he's going to hit me so hard that I'm going to die. Like, this is when he's going to slap the kids and I'm going to shoot him. (laughs) Um, the person that I know that was in a domestic violence um, marriage, I'm not going to say who it was, but they had three kids. And she said that one night she slept on the couch with a shotgun because she told him, she told him, she said, if you step through that threshold right there with her kids, she slept with her kids on the couch in the living room and she said if I hear you step through the doorway or the thresh like the threshold from the kitchen to the um living room she said I'll shoot you I won't ask questions um I'll just shoot you you know (laughs) and luckily she didn't because unfortunately in that situation you know screwed up but she would have went to prison and he would have been dead, but her kids would have gotten taken away. And that's another thing that's... We're not going to get on that. But, <laughs> I mean, there's a certain... Obviously, if it's self-defense and, you know, you're wrestling with a gun or something like that. And you accidentally shoot the person. But, and you got, like, you know, beat up before that. Um, but, you know, the person that I'm talking about, um, he would actually put his hands on the three kids as well. You know, one of them was older. And he would hit him a lot. And uh, he would always kind of keep his mom from getting beat up so much. And um, but I just can't even imagine. Like, the thought... My husband would never put his hands on me. And never put his hands on the kids. But the thought of someone putting their hands on my kids... Especially my husband. Like, my husband knows. Like, if you... Which... He just automatically knows because of how mama bearish I am. <laughs> I'm like a big mama bear. Um, he knows, like, if he or anyone ever touched my kids in a way that wasn't, uh, you know, nice. <laughs> if they ever put their hands on my kids, I will kill you. So, just understand that. Um, <laughs> and he knows that. Like, he would never, ever put his hands on one of the kids. And he wouldn't do that anyways. I mean... I'm very lucky to have never been in a domestic violence relationship. Now, I have been in a, um, I'm going to wrap this up, I swear. But also, it's not just physical violence. you got to also look at it as emotional, um, mental. You know, mental abuse is definitely as bad as physical abuse, in my opinion. Because if you are dating or married to someone that is a narcissist, I mean, it's pretty rough. (laughs) It can get pretty bad to the point where you're just like, you start thinking you're crazy. You know, they start turning the tables and making you think like you're insane. Um, 
and that one you definitely need to run away or get help from that as well so just keep that in mind and we'll put all those links down below so hopefully i haven't taken up too much of you guys' time rambling on um this is not as hard as i thought it was going to be doing this by myself i've done another one by myself but it was kind of just reading off different mandela effects so it really wasn't that hard <laughs> but this is the first actual like true crime case i've done by myself but it really wasn't that bad i don't have someone to bounce off ideas but that's okay Next week, hopefully, Hannah will be back, and we hope that you guys have a fantastic weekend. Um, go ahead and go to our social media, like, and comment, and all that on our all of our stuff. Um, if you follow us on social media, you can keep up with any time that we may not post, because maybe we had, like, a technical difficulty, or maybe we just couldn't get together to get our schedules together. Um, my son is playing two different footballs. He's playing for school and city league, and my daughter is playing soccer. So, um, if you could see my schedule right now, every single Saturday she has soccer games. And when I say games, I do mean games in plural, like three games in one day. Um, and then, you know, my son has football during the week. So, it's been crazy. And hopefully, if you keep up with us on social media, that's where we post, oh, we're not going to be able to put an episode up this weekend, or oh, we will, yada, yada, yada. Also, let us know if you guys want us to redo BTK. We've thought about it. We still have all the material for BTK, and obviously I remember that like the back of my hand. So that was the first episode we ever did. We don't have it on our Spotify and Apple and all that, but we do have it on our YouTube. However, we were new and we had a crappy microphone <laughs> and um, we just really wanted to kind of redo that one. So if you want to redo on the BTK, let us know. And yeah, hope you guys have a fantastic weekend and we will see you guys next time. Bye.